let's get started, please. So what we want to do today is we want to study what we can reasonably, what kind of problems we can reasonably expect to, uh, to solve, right? Now, <clears throat> you see, for all practical purposes, if an algorithm runs in, say, uh, time theta of, uh, say, n to the 8, obviously this is not practically useful algorithm because even for relatively modest sizes of input, uh, n to the 8 will be prohibitively large, right? But unfortunately, specifying the degree is, uh, for theoretical kind of analysis, is not very uh, convenient. So instead, uh, we proclaim that uh, feasible algorithms, namely those that are actually executable with, uh, with, uh, within reasonable amount of time, are all algorithms that terminate in polynomial time, which means that uh, for certain uh, integer natural number k, the running time is bounded by n to the k, right? Now, it turns out, uh, even though, as I say, uh, an algorithm that runs on ti in time n to a million is obviously completely useless, it turns out that this is a good polynomial time computability. It's very convenient uh, kind of boundary between what's computable and in, within reasonable time and what is not, because if all our algorithms that are computable in polynomial time and have practical significance actually run in a relatively small exponent of n, you know, most of them would run, say, at most uh, n to the fourth, maybe n to the fifth, right? On the other hand, um, we, so we don't have uh, really examples of practically important algorithms that run in time O of uh, n to 100, right? So this boundary is convenient because, as we will see, it allows elegant theoretical development. And on the other hand, all that is on feasible side actually tends to be um, bounded by a polynomial of reasonably a low degree. Now, what is a decision problem? A decision problem is just a problem with a yes, no answer, right? So examples of decision problems would be, uh, is input number n a prime number, right? So the answer to this question is clearly either yes or no. Another example would be, is the input graph uh, connected, uh, right? Or for example, uh, does input graph G have a cycle containing all vertices of G, right? Which we call Hamiltonian cycle. Um, so, and we say that a decision problem is in polynomial time if there exists a polynomial time algorithm that decides it. Right? Um, so clearly, uh, whether input graph is connected is uh, uh, testable in polynomial time um, by algorithms that you are familiar with. Um, is uh, a number n a prime number? Well, that's a big and uh, kind of spectacular theorem, uh, relatively recent, that uh, um, this is, in fact, decidable in polynomial time, and it turns out that it's one of rare uh, problems that actually original algorithm ran in time n to the 8, but I think uh, subsequently has been reduced. Okay, so, and we will see that the third example is actually a very tough uh, problem. So, 
so if a decision problem is a polynomial time, then you can then you have an algorithm that uh, for every input x, uh, it outputs yes if uh, the property is, if x has that property, and otherwise outputs no. And we denote this by a belongs to p, where p stands for uh, polynomial time. Uh, now we said uh, that uh, we bound, uh, that we consider feasible algorithms those that run in polynomial time in the length of, imp of the input, right? So what is the length of an input? Well, if uh, input is a number, actually length of the input in any case is number of symbols which are needed to describe the input precisely. Obviously, this is vague description, because what does it mean to describe a problem precisely? But it turns out this is not too big obstacle. Um, for example, if x is an integer, then a length of the input can be taken to be simply the size of the number, the number of bits that your input has. Right, and notice that uh, if you have an uh, x as input, it doesn't take x many bits to describe it. It takes only log two uh, of x many bits. So don't confuse the size of the input number with the size of, with its length or the length of its uh, representation. Of course, we could take uh, that the length is uh, the number of digits in decimal. Right, and of course it will be more compact. You will have fewer symbols, but it turns out that the definition of polynomial time computability is actually robust with respect to how you represent inputs. Right, for as long as you don't make artificial uh, redundancies. Um, so, uh, for example, if you represent your input number in decimal rather than binary, uh, the size of the input contracts by a constant factor. So if uh, uh, your algorithm ran in O of, say, n squared um, many steps, when n is the input, the length of the input, uh, this n can change only for a constant factor, so uh, it will not change the asymptotic efficiency of, uh, of the algorithm, right? Say if the input is a weighted graph, then uh, g can be described by giving for each vertex a list of edges incident to that vertex, together with the weights of each edge represented in binary, right? Another option would be to represent graph G with its adjacency matrix. Well, of course, if your graph is sparse, if it has, uh, say, number of edges that is uh, linear in the number of vertices rather than quadratic, then representing it, uh, uh, such a graph with adjacency matrix is inefficient, right? The representation is unnecessarily large. However, if you do that, all what, and you have a graph algorithm that uh, uh, operates, say, in time n to the fifth, uh, well, uh, what can happen if you change the representation, right, the size can change polynomially, right? It becomes, say, quadratic rather than linear. But, and of course, this changes the, uh, the, the complexity in terms of the length of the input, but it can change it only the degree. If the, polynom if the algorithm was polynomial time with one representation of weighted graph, uh, it will be also polynomial time probably with a different uh, expo exponent uh, with another um, representation that is less parsimonious. But as I say, only the, pol the power of n changes and not whether a polynomial exists or not. 
Uh, so, in fact, you can completely ignore how you represent things because to mess things up, you kind of have to do something really silly and uh, uh, change the length uh, for a non-polynomial, uh, to produce a non-polynomial length of, of uh, uh, change of length. So, essentially, any reasonable representation of the problem is equally good to measure whether an algorithm runs in polynomial time or no, okay? So P time represents what we perceive as problems that we can actually solve. Even though, as I say, it includes problems that are solvable in n to the power thousand, which is obviously uh, practically useless, but it does happen that for, as I said, that for all practical algorithms, if they run in polynomial time, they run in polynomial of low degree, reasonably low degree. Now, um, we can, we say that, now we want to consider a totally different class of problems that is strictly, well, we believe strictly larger than problems that are solvable in polynomial time, namely the class of NP problems, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time problems. So what are these problems? These are problems, say A of X, say uh, A can be, uh, the graph has a, a cycle that contains all the vertices, uh, right? So uh, such, uh, such problems can be represented uh, by another problem in two variables so that A of X is true if and only if there exists Y so that B of X, Y uh, is true. Um, and that this predicate B of XY can be verified by an algorithm running in polynomial time in the length of just X, not Y. So it has to terminate within P of length of X many steps. What would be, so say, if your problem A is uh, a graph has a cycle that contains uh, all of the vertices, then Predicate B would be a graph G for standing for X, right? Or let's say graph X uh, is such that Y is a, uh, a simple cycle containing all the vertices, right? So clearly then A of X simply says uh, there exists uh, y so that b of x, y is true. And this element y is called, uh, uh, it is called a certificate for, for x, right? So um, in the case of our graph problem, b of x, y is obviously computable in polynomial time of x because if I give you uh, the graph and I give you the sequence, a permutation of its vertices, which would be y, then you can check whether x1, x2 is an edge, whether x2, x3 is an edge, whether xn, x1 is also an edge, obviously in polynomial time, in time linear in the number of... Uh, vertices and edges, right? So um, this is another important class of problems. So another example would be integer x is not prime because this predicate is equivalent to, this problem is equivalent to the problem that exists integer y so that x is divisible by y, right? So why does the predicate x is divisible by y uh, run in polynomial time in just length of x rather than it doesn't 
we can bound it only in terms of x without mentioning y. Why would be why this would be the case? So if I say uh, number uh, one seven three five eight five four is uh, divisible by uh, seven five six one. How would you check whether this is true in the number of steps that is polynomial in the length of this number only? Exactly. Just run the division algorithm and how many steps the division algorithm takes is obviously linear in the length, right? In fact, uh, y is uh, uh, of smaller or equal length than x. So uh, it, taking it into account, it cannot buy us uh, uh, more time, right? Um, so uh, actually, whether x is prime or not is decidable in polynomial time. So uh, rather than, and clearly, if something is decidable in polynomial time, it's also um, in NP, because for B, you can simply take uh, A of x, because A is, uh, uh, and b is j and y is just a dummy variable because a of x is already p time computable. Okay. So uh, here are the, some examples of NP decision problems. Uh, vertex cover. An instance is a graph G and an integer K. The problem is, uh, is there a subset of your graph? So this is your graph. These are the vertices. And the question is, can you isolate, can you choose k many vertices, right? And kind of intuitively, you paint them with a, a different color than the rest, so that for every edge, at least one of its ends is colored. So. Every edge of the graph has at least one end in that chosen set, right? This is the famous vertex cover problem. And why is it in NP? What would be, um, uh, what would be the predicate uh, B so that B apply to graph G and number k is true if and only if uh, there exists y so that uh, this is true. What would be the predicate b? What is y? What is the witness? Uh, what would you take for y? Hmm? So the, uh, the property is there exists a subset of vertices of your graph of size at most k, so that uh, every edge in the graph has at least one end uh, in k, in that, uh, in that subset. Let's call it y. How is this problem representable in this form? What will be y? So the problem says there exists a subset of size k so that every edge has at least one end in that subset. So what would be the predicate and why? The definition tells you why will be precisely this set. So the formula B will say y is a set of size at most k, and for every edge in G, at least uh, one end belongs to this set, right? So why do we call this that this is non-deterministically computable, decidable problems? You can think of this set as a lucky guess. So uh, rather than immediately doing some polynomial computation, 
you guess what the solution is and then you verify whether this is really a solution. And something is in NP if and only if it's true if there exists such a guess. Right? So, for example, vertex cover, the proper guess would be simply what set you should choose uh, as uh, the set of colored vert vertices. Uh. Another example is satisfiability problem. You are given a form propositional formula in, canon in a conjunctive normal form. So your formula is a conjunction of clauses in which each clause is a disjunction of propositional variables or their negations. So notice in this example, we have one, two, three clauses. And each clause is a disjunction either of a letter or a negated letter, right? And the question is, uh, the problem is, uh, uh, is there an evaluation of the propositional variables which makes this formula true? Okay, so what do you think for that problem? What will be, if this is your A, what will be your B and your Y? Exactly. So uh, the witness or the certificate for that formula will be an assignment which makes that formula true. And to, che to check whether the assignment makes a formula true is easily doable in polynomial time because for each conjunct you can uh, simply look up all of the values and see whether at least one of them is true, right? So this is easily testable in polynomial time. So, now, um, in case if all of the conjuncts involve uh, uh, three uh, variables or negated variables, right, uh, like the very last conjunct here, if all of the conjuncts have uh, three what's called the literals, a literal is either a variable or negated variable. Uh, then uh, we call uh, the corresponding satisfiability problem 3SAT. Okay, now, um, as we mentioned, problem integer is not prime, is obviously in NP. Uh, because to verify that integer is not prime, it's enough to guess y which divides uh, that integer, right? Integer will be not prime if and only if you can find y that divides x and y dividing x is computable in polynomial time. However, it has been proved in 2002, so relatively recently, that in fact this problem can be decided deterministically in polynomial time just by a standard algorithm without any guessing of uh, certificates. And it was an expected result because uh, people believe that um, primality is not in P time, right? Because, for example, encryption algorithms rely on the fact that factoring an integer is, appears to be hard, even though we cannot prove it rigorously. But uh, uh, um, it turns out the testing for, for primality is uh, quote-unquote easy because it's doable in polynomial time. Well, maybe the whole class that we introduced is redundant, right? Maybe all problems that are in NP are already uh, in P. Maybe... So to see, you see, by brute force, if I give you a formula in conjunctive normal form that has, say, n letters, all what you have to do is test two to the n different assignments and check for each of them whether a formula, the formula is true or not, right? And see whether there is one that makes the formula true. But this does not mean maybe there is some fancy way 
that without going through brute force search that is exponential in time, that you can do it actually by some clever way in polynomial time. Intuitively, this shouldn't be the case because just checking whether an assignment makes a formula true should be easier than figuring out if there exists one of exponentially many possible assignments that it is true. And guess 99% of computer scientists and mathematicians believe that this is true, but despite the fact that huge number of uh, people that include very famous people uh, try to solve this problem and uh, no one could do it. And worse, uh, uh, even though people who do computational complexity would uh, kill me for that, but we almost made no progress in solving this uh, problem. Um, and people believe that, and in fact, it's one of the hardest problems in mathematics today, and it has a bounty of a million dollars from a Canadian math institute. Whoever solves it uh, gets a million dollars from, uh, from them. They proved that primality is in P. What we cannot prove is that uh, it is not the case that every NP problem is actually in P or not in P, right? So for some NP problems, we did find out that actually they were not hard. They are solvable directly in polynomial time by a deterministic procedure. But there are plenty of NP problems for which uh, there is no polynomial time algorithm to date. And uh, as we will see, uh, people believe uh, for a good reason that uh, simply there cannot be uh, one. One example is the example with the graph that I gave you. If you have a graph, right, uh, the question is, uh, can you find a Hamiltonian tour? So can you go along the edges of that graph always and visit uh, each vertex exactly once? Uh, and go back to the starting point, right? Um, so that's called a Hamiltonian cycle. And uh, we can show that, in, that unless all NP problems are in P, that this problem cannot be in P, right? So it's inherently hard. OK, and the conjecture that NP is not, in fact, equal to P, is called uh, the P not equal NP conjecture. Okay, now, one would, uh, I should tell you, I guess, that right now, uh, one could say, who cares whether your propositional formulas have satisfying assignment or not? I'm not interested, I'm a practicing computer scientist and I don't care about propositional formulas. Well, it turns out that there are in fact NP problems that are fundamentally important for practice, right? And one example of such a problem is the traveling salesman problem. So to give you an example, Maybe instead of a salesman, let's look at a mailman. So you have a post office, and your mailman gets a list of addresses where he has to deliver mail, right? And the problem is, uh, given the distances between any two addresses, can he find a tour or visit every address once and come back to the post office while traveling less than this prescribed bound, say, k many kilometers. Uh, we don't have, uh, let alone solving the problem, what is the tour 
that the mailman should go that is the shortest among all tours that visit all of the addresses. And you can see that this is for logistical point of view, this is a crucially important uh, problem, right? Um, another example is uh, a register allocation, right? You have program variables and you draw a graph of all the program variables and you connect two variables by an edge if these two variables are live at the same instant of execution, if there exists a step of execution where both variables are needed. Now, why is this important? Obviously, you, if you uh, want to assign your variables to the registers, if two variables will be needed at the same instant of execution, you cannot assign them to the same register, right? So you are given the number of registers and you are given your program and you have to decide if it's possible to allocate the variables into the registers so that uh, uh, no conflict ever happens, so that uh, uh, you always have all the variables uh, that you need during the execution in distinct uh, registers. Uh, and this is obviously extremely important uh, um, uh, problem. Uh, from graph theoretic perspective, this is called k-coloring co problem, right? The question is you are given a graph and k colors, and the question is can you color the vertices so that no edge has both ends of the same color, right? Which would correspond to assigning colors being the uh, indices of the registers, right? Uh, and a lot of, say, scheduling problems in uh, processor, in execution of problems, uh, um, and just a huge number of problems are NP uh, sorry, NP problems, so it's impossible to ignore them. It's not just satisfiability of propositional formulas. So now what we would like to do is, uh, we would like to compare, given two problems, how hard is one with respect to the other, right? So to do that, uh, uh, we define the notion of polynomial reducibility. So to explain what polynomial reducibility is, say you have two problems. One is u and the other one is v. And all instances for which u is true are in red and all instances for which u is true are in green. So for example, if uh, G, if uh, uh, the universe of instances uh, is collection of all graphs, then uh, say uh, up to a certain size, then and the property is uh, having a Hamiltonian uh, cycle, then red would be graphs that it's impossible to visit all the vertices uh, uh, once going through just the edges of the graph. So those that do not have Hamiltonian cycles will be in red and those that do have will be in green. So we say that U is polynomial time reducible to V. If there exists a polynomial time computable function so that when you apply it to an instance of a problem U that is true, it will be mapped into an instance that V is true. And if you have an instance where U is false, it will be mapped into an instance where V is false, right? If such a function F exists, obviously in a sense, 
u cannot be harder to solve than v. Why? Because if there was a polynomial time computable function that does this reduction, then solving problem for an instance x, or solving problem u at an instance x, you can simply apply your function f and solve the corresponding problem for uh, the, the v problem for f of x. And because f is p-time computable, it falls within a paradigm of simple things, so to speak. So if you had a method that solves v, you automatically have an almost equally of equal complexity method to solve u because you simply compute the value of x, f of x, and you, and you see whether v of x is true or false. Okay, is this clear? Right, so by a polynomial time computation, you can reduce problem V to, the, to problem U. So, example of polynomial reductions. Every instance of the general SAT problem is polynomially reducible to an instance of three SAT. Remember, so SAT is just satisfiability on any uh, propositional formula in conjunctive normal form, and 3SAT is satis satisfiability of formulas so that each clause has exactly three literals, three letters or negated letters. So how do we show, so what we have to come up is a polynomial time computable function which transform, transforms any instance of SAT into a corresponding instance of 3SAT that has the property that the original problem is satisfiable if and only if the image problem that is a 3SAT a three formula, right, is satisfiable. And this is done by a simple trick usually called chaining. So the idea is you, we will replace each clause with a conjunction of clauses that contain additional propositional variables. How do we do that? Well, we split the, we partition the formula into pieces by taking first two um, propositional letters, then taking individual all other propositional letters except the last two. And then we map this formula into the following formula. You form the first conjunct by taking the first two disjuncts of your clause and then adding or not Q1 where Q1 is a new variable, okay? And then you conjunct this with a formula that has one space for a payload and has two hooks, so to speak. The hooks are this not Q1 and Q2, and the payload is not P3. Notice uh, here um, P3 is this piece of the formula, and we kind of hook it up with this piece by having here a disjunction of with Q1 and here a disjunction of not Q with not Q1. The rightmost hook is always uh, hook is always a letter and leftmost hook is always negated the previous uh, letter, right? And in the end, you finish with the last piece. Now, the claim is that the above formula is satisfiable for an assignment. Then that assignment can be extended with the assignment of Qs that also makes the whole conjunction true, and vice versa. If this formula is true for a certain assignment, then the restriction of this assignment to P's will make this formula true. So let's see why this is the case. Well, um, assume that first say that this formula is true. Uh, this would mean 
that all the conjuncts must be true, right? Now, if the first conjunct is true because either P1 is true or not P1, P2 is true, then you see that uh, such a, an assignment will make uh, also this formula true. So this formula will be false only if uh, P1 is false and not P2 is false. But then, because this conjunct is true, Q1 must be true. But if Q1 is true, then the other hook here will be false. So in order to have this formula true, either the payload has to be true or Q2 has to be true. If payload is true, then voila, you have this formula must be also true. If the payload is false, uh, this means Q2 is true. But this forces Q, uh, that, uh, yeah, this forces Q2 to be true, which in turn forces not Q2 to be false. So either P4 is true or Q3, Q3 is true. If P4 is true, voila, this formula is also true. Otherwise, if Q3 is true, not Q3 is false. And you are left that at least one of the last two letters, uh, I mean literals, has to be true. And consequently, this formula is, will be true. So the truth of this formula implies the truth of that formula. And it's easy to um, uh, go in opposite direction. If this formula is true, you localize which literal makes it true you make sure that this literal is true here, and then it's easy to see that you can then uh, assign uh, the values of the Qs to make all other formulas, all other conjuncts true, because if this is true, you can make not Q1 false, so Q1 will be true, and this takes care of this, and so forth. So just by a simple argument, uh, we see that indeed um, this transformation uh, simply replacing this disjunct, this clause, with a conjunction of these smaller clauses will result in a formula that is satisfiable if and only if the original formula is satisfiable. And clearly this is a polynomial time transformation. The recipe how to build this formula can be done in linear time from that formula. Okay, so um, now the main importance, I mean the main feature of NP problems is that they allow universally hard problems. Namely, uh, Cook showed, this is the, by far the most famous theorem in computer science, that every NP problem whatsoever, Hamiltonian cycle or vertex cover, is reducible by a polynomial time uh, reduction to the SAT problem, to the satis satisfiability problem. So, in order to show that all NP problems are polynomial time computable, it would be enough to show that SAT is P time computable because any other problem is P time reducible to SAT. So, if you could solve SAT in P time, you could also sol solve any other problem simply by reducing it to SAT and then solving SAT in P time. So in a sense, uh, satisfiability is uh, omniscient NP problem because knowing how to do it allows you to solve any other problem. Okay, uh, now. Um, so, 
Um, we say that, um, or did I define it or did I forget to, ah, here it is. So an NP decision problem is NP complete if every other NP problem is polynomial time reducible to you. So uh, a problem is NP complete if and only if, if it happens the following. So your problem is NP complete, right? If for any other NP problem, right, uh, you can reduce it to your problem U, right? Which means there exists a polynomial time computable function which maps uh, true instances of, say, your problem V into problem U that is complete and all false instances into false in instances uh, here. So this is the definition of uh, an NP-complete problem because it allows you to reduce solving any other problem to that problem. So Cook's theorem says, in fact, then that SAT is NP-complete. Now, um, you know, um, one might expect that, uh, so if P is not equal to NP, right? If not all polynomial time, NP, com NP problems can be solved in polynomial time, then satisfiability um, cannot be solved in polynomial time, right? No matter how big exponent you take, right? Well, someone might say that's very nice that satisfiability is such a hard problem, but I do not care about satisfiability. Well, guess what? After Cook proved this theorem, um, everyone saw it as a kind of theoretical, theoretically interesting result, but of little practical influence until uh, uh, Dick Karp actually published a paper in which he showed that 21 problems that everyone was desperately trying to solve because they were fundamentally practically important, like the traveling salesman program problem or the uh, register allocation problem for compilers, that all of these 21 problems are NP-complete. And this put a kind of a stop on efforts to solve this problem. And in fact, CARP is probably even more than Cook um, uh, re, uh, kind of responsible for people abandoning uh, attempts uh, to uh, solve these uh, problems, such as traveling salesman uh, problem, right? Um, so, so NP-complete problems are not at all a theoretically kind of academic nicety. They are everywhere, and as I mentioned, a traveling salesman problem is one such. So you are given a weighted graph with locations as vertices, and you can assume that it is a complete graph, and with edges connecting these vertices, which represent, say, roads connecting these locations, and with weights of these edges representing the lengths of these roads, right? and you are given a number L, and you have to determine if there is a tour that visits each of these locations, and the total length of the tour is smaller than L, right? And of course, you, it's easy to believe that people try to solve this because it's a, it's a logistics problem. You know, in America, milk used to be the, delivered by trucks, right? That would go from a location to a location, 
And the question is, uh, it's a matter of saving fuel, which, in which order should you uh, visit the, the addresses so that you travel the shortest possible distance. Um, or, as I mentioned, the register allocation uh, problem. Can you allocate all the variables of the program into uh, registers, k-many registers uh, in a machine, so that uh, uh, no two variables are placed in the same register if both variables will be needed at certain instant of the uh, of the execution, right? And this fundamentally changes if you can do that, then you don't have to reload data from memory into the registers and it has huge impact in the speed of execution, right? So it's not a, at all a theoretical nicety, it's uh, something that practicing engineers, especially computer scientists, have to deal with every day. And, uh, uh, our PhD students, very often it happens that the problem they are trying to solve turns to be NP-complete and thus unsolvable. So why am I teaching you this? I'm teaching you this because it's so easy that you are given a problem to solve. I mean, you might be designing a compiler for all of the things, right? Um, and so it's crucially important to know when to suspect that the problem might be NP-complete because if it's NP-complete, you should abandon attempting to solve it. So you simply don't waste your time because you simply cannot do it. It's not that you are not clever enough, simply in all likelihood there is no feasible solution, okay? What do people do, right? If a register allocation is an NP-complete problem, you cannot simply tell your boss, forget about writing me writing this compiler, it involves solving a problem that no one can solve, right? Well, uh, in, if you uh, encounter an NP-complete problem, uh, then uh, you, what you do is you don't try to solve your problem optimally, but you try to find an approximation that can be feasibly computed, so in polynomial time, and that it is not too bad, right? So, uh, knowing how to recognize that a problem is intractable is crucial because then rather than thinking how to solve it, you should be thinking of some heuristics how to approximate it. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, thankfully there is a Bible on this topic called Computers uh, Intractability how is it called, uh, uh, intra, uh, intra computers and intractability that contains about 300 examples uh, of uh, <coughs> problems that in all likelihood <coughs> are not solvable in polynomial time. And so if you figure out, uh, if you start suspecting that the problem at hand does not allow feasible solution, you look through the book to find something similar. And lo and behold, for vast majority of problems, uh, one of the tricks in that book allows you to, in fact, prove that your problem is intractable. Because if you are not sure that the problem is intractable, and it turns out that you were wrong, and you did some approximation, maybe your competition will exactly solve the problem and produce a superior, a, a product of superior performance. So, proving that a problem is NP-complete is not for kind of academic uh, 
a nice enterprise, but it's a guarantee that you sh that this problem is not solvable and that you uh, that your competition won't be able to solve it either. So then you look for a, a good practical, uh, good heuristics uh, to solve it. Just to give you an idea, here is another set cover problem. Uh, I mean, NP-complete problem that is called set cover. So assume you want to buy DVDs, each with one out of N movies that you like. So you got sick and tired of studying computer science, and you compiled a list of 150 great movies that you want to see to retain your sanity, right? Unfortunately, nowadays, the stores usually don't sell individual DVDs, but they sneakily sell them only in bundles of DVDs. And lo and behold, for every movie that you want to see, you see in the inventory of your uh, local store that, in fact, there is a bundle that contains uh, uh, a movie that you want. Uh, and some of the bundles may contain several uh, movies that you like, and so some movies might be contained in several bundles. And your task is to pick the cheapest collection of bundles that contain every movie among them that you want to have. Right? So you can think of these bundles as sets, and what you want them, and you have another set of elements that you want to have, and you want to find the cheapest collection of sets that, whose union contains the collection you want. So it is really nothing academic about that. It is uh, a practical problem that is NP complete. Or, for example, you might have several software packages with different functionalities, uh, and you want to choose uh, the smallest collection of software packages that has all the functionalities that your company needs, and that some total of the licensing fees is minimal. Okay, so let's now make a short uh, break, and we want to see how we deal with such problems. Uh, 